All right, everybody, welcome back to the Steel City Blitz Steelers podcast presented by Deck Roofing Incorporated of South Florida. And your Pittsburgh Steelers are now 4-0 and on the season after a 38-29 win at home over the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, we will cover that. We will look ahead to the big matchup with the Cleveland Browns in week six and uh, discuss why Tennessee getting off the hook is ridiculous. And oh, I'm sure we'll probably have a few comments on Le'Veon Bell going from New York Jets to the Kansas City Chiefs and all that other stuff. Um, and joining me are uh, Ian and Ben. And again, we won't do much small talk here because people just don't want to hear that. Um, so, uh, gentlemen, uh, your thoughts, uh, Ben, go ahead. Your thoughts on the uh, rather high scoring affair against our uh, in state rivals. Uh, offense came through, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's that's the global picture. The offense came through. Um, ben was absolutely money on third down. Uh, the way that he moved his receivers around, uh, the way that he chose the routes he chose and chose the targets he chose was it was money. And in particular on third down, that was, you know, that, that was where it really counted. And, and he was masterful. I know he didn't throw for a lot of yards, but scored an awful lot of points yeah, and kept moving the chains. And it, it was fantastic. He did a great, great job in my opinion on mm-hmm. Sunday. Uh, that's the best I've seen him this year. And it's, it's his mental game that seems yep. to be getting sharper and sharper. And it's not like he was, he was a dumb quarterback before. Uh, on the other side of the ball, defensively, mm-hmm. the drop off we've seen this year was at its worst on Sunday, yeah. and that is the defense is not getting off the field on third down. Mm-hmm. And you know, some of that was there were some BS penalties, and there were some yeah. some non calls that hurt them pretty bad. Um, but you know. That DPI on Joe Hayden, that was legit, in my opinion. I didn't think it was when I was watching it live, but when I watched mm-hmm. the, the All-22, I was like, yeah, that's that's DPI. He screwed up. Yep. Um, you know, and, and it's it's dumb stuff. Um, Vince putting his 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 helmet in the in the quarterback in Wentz's chest, that was dumb. He didn't need to do that. It was just dumb. And it's not like yep. that's not a Vince type of play, you know, and no. and they would have gotten off the field in that instance, too. Um, you know, so it was it was stuff like that, that, you know, they they had some some other issues, too. I I understand the thought process be- behind playing off coverage like they were doing on third down consistently, mm-hmm. because it's mm-hmm. easier to to disguise coverage when you're playing off than when you're up against, you know, you're up yeah. against the line. But they were giving them enough room to move the chains. They weren't playing the the sticks. And as a result, they kept converting third downs over and over and over again. And yeah, Tomlin's right. You have to give the Eagles some credit. Went through some balls that were absolutely money. And Fulgham, in particular, made some catches that were absolutely money. Mm -hmm. So you got to give the Eagles some credit. But the Steelers' defense has played much better much better yep yeah i i agree um ian i i I don't want to say anything i want to go ahead and and get your uh initial thoughts on both sides of the ball from sunday so uh, to echo what ben said the the offense was great and on top of all the the mental game stuff of ben Mm -hmm. continued improvement that last touchdown to chase claypool what the ben made the audible on the field and basically changed the route combination because of the coverage he saw. Mm-hmm. That is something that we absolutely would not have seen either of the quarterbacks that played last year do. Oh, they would have walked God. up the line and said, you know, hut one, hut two, snap, you know, yeah. um, and see what happens. So, I mean, the the difference between Ben and Mason Rudolph just in that kind of situation is tremendous, and that Huge. should not be overlooked. Uh, last week on the podcast, I talked about, you know, that I thought the game would be closer than a lot of people were hoping for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there would be some consternation amongst Steelers fans, which obviously there was. Um, But nevertheless, the line was seven. We won by nine. So we did cover for those that Mm -hmm. placed money on the game. Um, 
and we scored over 30 points for the first time since uh, that game that we won't talk about other than uh, Keenan Allen being covered by a linebacker. Um, <laughs> Which and, was 2018, by the way. Yes, yes. Yeah. Feels even longer ago. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're right. The The defense gave up a lot on third downs. On the whole this season, we're allowing 50% conversion rate on yep. third downs, which is 27th in the league, which is just dreadful. It's, oh, I didn't it's know it was that awful. bad. Really? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, the good news is that offensively, we're converting at almost the same rate, about 48%, which is mm-hmm. ninth best in the league. So the offense did a really good job sustaining drives, keeping things going. Uh, the Eagles had no answer for Chase Claypool at, at all. Um, no. Some of it because of his size, some of it because of his, his speed, and some of it just because of Ben moving him around in places where he mm-hmm. hadn't even lined up this year, so they weren't even prepared to defend. I mean, they had Nathan Gary, who we talked about last week, how much he sucked covering tight ends. Well, he certainly wasn't even in the same zip code as Claypool on that last play. <laughs> um, you know, bold, bold strategy, Cotton, to put your worst defender on the guy who's already scored three touchdowns. So, um <laughs> They the Steelers did a really good job scouting the Eagles. We talked last week about how the Eagles defense was susceptible to those jet sweeps, those motions that they over pursued mm-hmm. a lot. Um, and you know, Ray Ray McLeod had that big run, fifty eight yards, I think, down the field. Um, they they handed off to wide receivers some other times and got some good gains out of it, which was good because they were doing those motions early in the game. But the Eagles weren't really respecting them because the Steelers mm-hmm. run those motions and never hand off to those guys. And we finally True. started handing off to them and got some big chunk plays out of it. I don't know if we'll have that same success against Cleveland this week just because they have a little bit different of a defense. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I'll mention about Fulgham um, is for a, a vast majority of the game, Fulgham was lining up in the slot and we were defending him with Mike Hilton. And Fulgham's like 6'3 and Hilton's 5'9 at best if we're, yeah, being, uh, if yeah. we're being generous. A little short so, of that. Yeah, so some of the some of the catches that Fulgham made were just because of the size difference that he was able to go up over Hilton. Hilton was in good position, and Fulgham is just a bigger guy and, and made catches. Um, that said, at the biggest moment of the game on their next to last drive, uh, they switched and put Joe Hayden on him, and Hayden came up with a pass breakup when it really counted. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it may have taken the Steelers a little while to adjust to that and actually put our best cover corner on the guy who was killing us but nevertheless it wasn't there were some defensive breakdowns don't get me wrong but some of the time it was just you know their guy made a better play on the ball than our guy and um you know sometimes sometimes that happens even if it's an undrafted guy um that you know made his first nfl catch the week before it's just (laughs) you know that said steven nelson had two picks last week we've got (laughs) we've We've got uh, um, seven turnovers in four games on the season, which is really stinking good. And the offensive line, even though David DeCastro went out, only gave up one sack, which was on the first drive of the game. And after that, they, the Eagles came into this game leading the league in sacks. And right. after that first drive, we didn't give up another sack the whole rest of the game. So great job all around on offense, mm-hmm. even in the little things. And... Um, uh, I'll, I'll just continue jumping into this since I'm already talking. But I'll tell you what, Juju Smith-Schuster has been outstanding this year. He he may not have the numbers right. that we saw out of him a couple years ago, but he is doing all the little things that it takes for a team to win. I mean, he's blocking on running plays. He's even that game against the Giants. We saw him chase down and recover that fumble with yep. seven or eight Giants in the picture. Um, you know, he's blocking for the other receivers when they catch the ball. He's you know taking crossing routes and getting out of bounds when they're in the two minute drill. That he's not trying to pad his stats with a couple extra yards. He knows that those seconds on the clock are worth more than a couple extra yards in his stat line. That he's he's been a completely unselfish player this year and doing all the little things that it takes for teams to be successful. And that's just fantastic to see great, great growth out of him. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, here, here's what I would say offensively. And I, I tweeted this, I think, Monday. Um, watching Roethlisberger operate on Sunday was um, 
uh, easily in 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 my time watching him one of the best uh, moments that that I can recall. Just just watching him operate. You know, you can when. when and you guys know this, you know, when you get the all 22, it, it makes such a difference on being able to see what the quarterback is seeing. Um, and you don't, you just can't get that on television. A lot of times you don't see the safeties. Some heck, sometimes you can't see either, you know, both corners. I mean, it, it, it can be frustrating, but, but to be able to watch him move his guys around like chess pieces on a board, um, and, and, you know, everybody's been talking about, he doesn't throw deep, blah, 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 man. I don't care. He was just letting these guys run those crossing routes and and just dinking and dunking and letting them do the work. And he was setting them up to be successful. And and he wasn't putting the ball at risk. Uh, you know, I mean, the guys turned the ball over one time now in four games. Um, and and everybody under the sun knows that that he's had a penchant for sometimes just turning the ball over too much. And and he hasn't done that to this point. I think he's just been really, really good. Um, you know, de- defensively, um, I think Steve Stefan too had a sneaky good game. I don't think a lot of people really talked about him much. Uh, I think he ended up with a sack and a half. Um, and and you know, as as far as the secondary, and, and Ben, I'll toss this over to you now. What do you, what do you think's happening? Because it, it looks to me like teams are getting Minka Fitzpatrick to kind of suck up a little bit and then they throw over the top of him. Um, and, and I've seen that a couple times with Hayden in coverage and a couple times with Nelson in coverage. So what, what's going on here? Uh, you know, I, I, I think that's an oversimplification of what they're doing. They're just going yeah. away from him. They're just going away from him. I mean, they're, I mean, I guess the better way to put it would be an overcomplication of what they're doing. They're just going away from Minka. They're they're keeping away from him. They're not trying to give him an opportunity to to pick anybody off at this point. And it was mm-hmm. the same thing we saw the latter half of last year. It's just a continuation of it. So you know, eventually those opportunities are going to present themselves, and I think he'll capitalize on them. Maybe this week. I mean, yeah. you got a guy, you got a guy in Cleveland who likes to take chances, and I think the game plan going into this game has to be to stop the run and force Baker to not be a game manager, but actually, you know, put the team on his back and, Mm -hmm. and, and win and beat you. So this could be the week that that happens. I do want to get back to one thing we were just talking about a minute ago Mm -hmm. with, with regard to Ben, uh, per what Claypool said after the game, what Chase Claypool said after the game, uh, basically when Ben changed the play at the line, he had to tell, the receivers what he wanted them to run and he told juju that he had an out because he wanted him to carry the safety toward the sideline right and away from claypool and he told claypool what route to run too <laughs> so he told the defense <laughs> <laughs> and it still worked <laughs> well it still it, yeah worked that to it, me is absolutely nuts because i mean he basically he'd already chosen where he was going to go mm-hmm. before the ball was even snapped he knew what he wanted. The, he wanted the receivers to do, and how he wanted the, the route concept to develop. And he told them what routes to run, and it still worked. That to me is insane. Uh, getting back to uh, Minka, I'm not super concerned about it. I mean, based mm-hmm. upon what I've seen watching film, he's fine. It's they're just going away from him, uh, and sometimes yes, Minka's trying to be aggressive. I think that maybe he's trying a little too hard to make something happen because he's Mm -hmm. feeling some kind of pressure from last season. He shouldn't, he should just play his game and not worry about it. Um, in my opinion. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I digress. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's, it's just an observation I've had. And I, and I think the key part of what you said there was, was trying to make something happen. He, I do get that feeling with him. Um, and, and I, I think once you let things just kind of fall in your lap, you keep working, you do your job, then, yeah. then yeah, good stuff starts to happen. That's, and, and that's just know. my instinct though. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't it. really have any reason to believe it. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Ian, um, drinking there. 
Uh, well, right now it's just water. I, I've got oh. a little uh, got a little b- b- bullet whiskey as well, but that was just a a little sip of water uh, to 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 wet the palate while I'm uh, chatting things up here. You know, um, you know, Ian, you, you were talking about earlier. You know how sometimes players just make plays, and and their players happen to make a couple of plays. Um, you know, Vince Williams, uh, you guys were talking about, you know, putting his helmet right into the center of Wentz's chest, drawing a penalty. You know, there was that play, but then there was that other play too, where, where Bud Dupree seemingly had Carson Wentz sacked. That was the same play, believe it or not. Um, he had him sacked. He got away, made a play. And, and that's when Williams, uh, uh, buried his helmet into his chest. I, you know, when they're giving up conversion, third down conversions at that rate of 50%, is that sometimes what goes into it is just guys just don't make plays because if, if Dupree makes that sack, then the personal foul never happens and uh, they have to kick a field goal there. Yep. Not even, I I think they were back behind the 50 when that happened, but if I recall, but that being said, it it goes back to what we talked about seemingly every week on the podcast but especially yeah. last week about how Wentz can be a slippery dude and when you have a shot to get him you have to get him on the ground and Dupree had him dead to rights and <sighs> Wentz just ducked over ducked under Dupree him. Yeah. basically just flew over his back and then Wentz scrambled out and and made that play so it's definitely you know it's one of those things where when you have a shot at the quarterback you have to make sure you get him on the ground and don't let him extend the play because bad things like that can happen the other yeah. thing I'll note uh, but circling back to Ben Roethlisberger is, you know, he's been able to spread the ball around this year because he hasn't had to force it to Antonio Brown, and he only has one pick instead of five, which he had in 2018. Yeah. It, is that Antonio Brown crying in the background while you say that? It's, yeah, it sounds like it doesn't. It? Yeah, it's my daughter. But um, I wake up when I started talking about AB. How about that? Yeah, yeah, something uh, uh, symbolic in that. Um, yeah, I think there's something to that, Ian. I think there's something definitely to the fact that, that Ben is not feeling the pressure of having to constantly feed Antonio Brown. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, uh, we would have had a, a pretty good glimpse of that last year, obviously had Ben not gotten hurt, but, um, Ben, uh, let's, let's talk injuries real quick. Uh, Marquise Pouncey did practice fully today, yep. which was good. He left, uh, the game late on Sunday with, uh, I believe they said a foot injury. Um, where are we at with Deontay and DeCastro? What's, what's the latest there? So Deontay is playing is my understanding. At least mm-hmm. they expect him to play. He was limited today, but it's, He's got a bruise on his back. He took a helmet to the back while he was laying on the ground. Yeah. Or apparently not on the ground. He was laying on another player. He was laying on another player mm-hmm. in a pile and someone dove into his back. What a bunch of fucking scumbags. I can't believe somebody did that. Um, well, yeah. So that happened on Sunday. That's what sent him out of the game. Uh, David DeCastro has... Uh, an oblique strain is my understanding, mm-hmm. which basically is like your side muscles, you yeah. know, and it's something that he is going to need. They do not expect him to play, and I don't expect him to play. Having had that injury before myself, I cannot imagine trying to move 300-pound men with that kind of an injury. Mm-hmm. So It's a kind that takes the air out of you, isn't it? No, it's not that no. bad, but uh, it's not like broken ribs or anything, but it's uh, – I mean, it just, you know, it hurts every, every time you try and do anything or lift yeah. anything or anything, push anything, it hurts. So I don't see it happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's put it this way. If he plays, it'll just get worse. It's, yeah. It's my guess um, based upon, you know, having the, had the injury before. Um, yeah. then, you know, and then beyond you've... that, I mean, you know, the, the Steelers are lucky. They're, they're pretty, pretty healthy. Um, Juju has got the knee thing going, but you know mm-hmm. it's been an ongoing thing for him. Uh, it looks like when he's got the issue or he's got swelling, they're going to hold him out on Wednesday, and then he's going to practice the rest of the week. Yeah, um, and uh, T.J. Watt uh, limited shoulder. with a shoulder. Yeah, um, but yeah, he yeah. He's, he went full today. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. again, not a big deal. 
Marcus Allen and Derek Watt coming back is is a big deal. That's going to be helpful. Yes. Um, which which you know, means Trey Edmonds back to the practice squad. Yeah, right? and he went back yeah. to the practice squad on Monday. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what'd you think of Kevin Dotson uh, in there? I mean, it, it's one thing, you know. Hey, kid, jump he on in there, good. but it, it's another. You've got to play against Fletcher, Clo- Fletcher Cox. Uh, Fletcher Cox. Yeah. yeah, he he was not good. He, uh, I mean, eh, it's fine. I mean, he's a rookie. Yeah. But he he did not look good. That had to be a humbling experience for him because his first game action when he was in there, yeah, he kind of dominated. <laughs> yeah, he did. That's right. You know, that's right. This this last game, uh, no, not not so much. So, what was uh, he? Was he just physically dominated? Was he beat? How how was he beaten specifically? Ah, uh, uh, a bit. You know, Cox is technically sound. And yeah. he's also a big, strong, fast son bitch. Very so, fast, dude. Yeah. You know, you got your hands full with that guy. It is what it is. You know, it's not going to be as big a challenge this week. But there are two things. One, Eric lines up all over the damn place. Yeah. So they may, I imagine they are going to try to get him against the right side of the Steelers offensive mm-hmm. line because that's where the weaker players are. Although I got to be honest with you, I think that Miles Garrett versus Alvia Nueva is a mismatch and it favors Garrett. But Sheldon Agreed. Richardson is also a handful. So pretty much every snap Dotson's going to have his hands full. Um I don't think that Richardson is as big a challenge as Fletcher Cox is. Mm-hmm. Just my opinion. I think Fletcher Cox is the best defensive tackle who doesn't play for the Rams in the NFL. Yeah, yeah, I I would agree. He's right up there. Yeah, um, he's really good. Yeah, yeah, he is. And uh, uh, well, I mean, we knew that. We we talked about the the Eagles having a very solid you know defensive line going in. It was just the back half of that defense that that was going to be a problem it's and not good. No, it's not. Um. Yeah, before we start talking Browns, just let me uh, remind everybody that you are, of course, listening to the Steel City Blitz Steelers podcast presented by Deck Roofing Incorporated of South Florida. Uh, Whether it's commercial, residential, multifamily, or condos, contact Deck Roofing today at deckroofing.com. And Browns, Ian, the Cleveland football Browns come in at 4-1. and Uh I guess before we even get to the football stuff, it is is this is a rhetorical question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay, is this game bigger for Cleveland than it is for Pittsburgh? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I was that was going to be my lead in was yeah that this is Cleveland Super Bowl. They haven't won in Pittsburgh since 2003, it's which been is 17 dumb. years. This is this is their Super Bowl. Name the quarterback. And, uh, was it Charlie Fry? Nope. No. Was it Colt McCoy? No, no, 2003. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, oh, hold on. I was I was at the game. Um, uh, oh come on, eight, six and ten. Um, was it Charlie Fry? No, no. Was the kid from Kentucky? Yes, it was. Tim Couch. Tim yeah. Couch. Yep. Yeah. Oh wow, Isn't that incredible. Yeah. 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 Sorry All right. to interrupt you, but at, I had to throw that rate. trivia nugget in there. Yeah. Yeah. At any rate. Cleveland hasn't won here in 17 years. This is their Super Bowl. This is our week six game. Yeah. Yeah. This the, is the our Steelers warm up are... for the fucking Ravens. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the Pittsburgh Steelers are well aware that no one has ever won a Super Bowl in October. The Cleveland Browns are not at all aware that no one has ever won a Super Bowl in October because mm-hmm. they've never won a Super Bowl, period. So they have no idea. Never even been to one. So. That said, I was glad that Tomlin this week in his press conference, at least publicly, right. treated this like a big game because he knows the Browns are going to be up for it. Oh, and come we've on, seen... man. They, no, they no, could no, be no. playing Mother Mary's school for the deaf and blind, and Tomlin would make them sound like they were all all pros. You're, you're right. He, he could... always does that. It doesn't he... matter who they're playing. Hey, Mother could... Mary's school once went over 500, let me yeah, tell you. So, know. you know. No, but the Tomlin came straight out. Class one A high school ball, but sure. <laughs> Tomlin came out this weekend and said this is a big game. 
I mean, he he said those words, so he wasn't. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like he was. It was during his rundown of saying, "Oh, this guy's good and this guy's good," mm-hmm, which he always mm-hmm. does, anyways. But oh, yeah. uh, he he said this is a big game, and that's we've seen in the past where other teams have come out, specifically the Ravens in years when the Ravens were bad. That the Ravens have come out with more intensity for the Steelers than the Steelers yeah. were able to match with. So yeah. I think from a from a public messaging standpoint, it's important that Tomlin gets across that his guys have to get up for this game because the Browns are going to treat it like their Super Bowl. They're going to be up for it. The Steelers, it's not our Super Bowl, but right. we need to match. We need to be able to match their intensity and their physicality because, as we saw last year, those guys were out there head hunting against us. I mean, oh, they yeah. knocked out Juju. They knocked out literally Mason Rudolph mm-hmm. and amongst other things. So. The the Browns will be up for this game. We need to match their intensity. Um, that said, the secret of Baker Mayfield is that he actually sucks. And <laughs> the Browns have done a lot this year with their running game. Yeah, and with play Number action one in passing. The league. Yep. Yeah. So the running game is good, and you have to respect that. But pretty much any time Baker throws the ball down the field, he's going off a of play action. And they're either rolling him out on a bootleg to try and get him away from their terrible offensive line, or he's going on some kind of deep drop to give him more time. Mm-hmm. And it's a simplified read. It's really only two guys out there that he's having to read. So they're not running complicated route concepts. It's mostly two or three man routes. And a lot of it's off a of play action, but the running game is so good that you have to respect that. So the, the way to beat this team is what Cle- or is what, uh, Baltimore did in week one which is to get up by a few touchdowns and take their running game out of it and make Baker have to throw the ball Mm -hmm. and then he'll start you said it earlier he'll he'll start taking chances and he'll make some bad decisions and you can get tips you can get picks and he's not the most accurate player or accurate passer right but when it's you know Mark Sanchez took the Jets to two AFC championship games by having a good running game and basically going play action and rolling out and having a two-man read yeah but they also had a really damn good defense they did they did yeah yeah the the browns do not have a really good defense well yeah they they rank uh well it's not it's, good they're, it's not they're just the their bottom. rank they they yeah. they're number 30 in terms of of touchdown passes surrendered to the opposition for example yeah. uh they're middle of the pack defending the run they're not they're not a good defense. They're just not. And that's that to me is is the key this week, in my opinion, is keeping that offense off the field, mm-hmm. keeping our offense on the field, scoring points, as Ian just pointed out. Yep. You get up by 14, now all of a sudden Baker's feeling pressure. He's going to take chances. Yes, he's going to throw the ball down the field. Uh, he's going to throw the ball behind his receivers. He's going to throw the ball short. We're going to have opportunities for picks. And that's going to deflate them even worse. Uh, I have my personal feeling is that when he gets really angry, he plays worse. Um, and a lot of guys and don't, but you, he's, you know, he's, he's a little a banged guy, up too. Yeah. He's not a guy you need to be. Yeah. He's got a, a rib injury. Yeah. Um, and, and, Cam Hayward took some uh, some criticism from Mary Kay Cabot today yeah. in the Cleveland. Uh, what the hell is the Cleveland paper? Plane dealer. dealer, a plane dealer, um, for saying what the hell did he say? Uh, he basically shit. said we're going to be physical with him and we're going to yeah we're going to be physical with him and at at uh, there it is because I quoted it back to her when she misquoted him. Mm-hmm. He said word for word, "I'm just trying to inflict good punishment." He's going to be a warrior for his team. It's up to us to make him think about that injury at the end of the day. So yep, yep. basically what he's saying is I'm going to hit him and I'm not going to really worry about trying to hit the injury. I'm just going to hit him. And when yeah. he's done, he's going to be sore and he's going to be thinking about it. That's yeah. my job. Yep. Um, yep. And, and he's right. That, that is his bluntly, job. That is his job. Uh, I think the, Offensive line in Cleveland is pretty good. I don't think they're great at pass blocking. I think they're mm-hmm. very good at run blocking, which is 
kind of a hallmark of, of a Bill Callahan coached offensive line is they're right. They're good at run blocking. They're not great at pass blocking. And this one is no exception. Um, we do have to limit. I mean, the Steelers are very good at defending the run. We, we know this, Yeah, but, but they've got to limit this team to, you know, we've got to put them in situations where it's third and long and then not play off coverage so damn much. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. Uh, My frustration level seeing that constantly was, was quite high, but, uh, again, this is going to be a different offense, and I'm sure Keith Butler will have some different things um, uh, cranked up for this one. Um, so, flip it over to the other side of the ball. You know, you you guys made the comment about you know maybe our best defense is having our offense on the field as long as possible, and, and obviously scoring points. Um, that that defense isn't great, but it's got a couple of good individual players. We you know I, I think Garrett obviously is a good player. Um, I think Denzel Denzel Ward, I think, is a yep. is a decent corner, and, and Richardson yeah. is a is a good defensive tackle. Too. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the Steelers' running game is Although Denzel Ward's got an injury, doesn't he? He's he's limited in practice this week. I think. Uh, well, I know Harrison's dealing with a concussion. Um, one of the other DBs. Um, I'd have to look back at it, but see. today's injury report. Uh, Beckham went home sick. Mm-hmm. Illness, uh, Tay Davis, elbow limited. Jordan Harrison concussion. Harrison safety. Ron Harrison concussion did not practice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's not good because if he's in the protocol, he's got to practice to get out of protocol. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Kareem Hunt this thigh limited. He's playing. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Carl Joseph hangstring did not practice. That nope. is a big one for them. Uh, Jarvis Landry did not practice hip ribs. He's uh, playing though. Oh yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Baker Mayfield chest. He is limited today. Nothing on Ward because right? I don't remember seeing nothing on him. Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, he's sore, but a lot of guys are sore this time of year. You know. Yeah. So Ian, how do you attack that Cleveland defense then? Because I, I, I think there's some that will argue that maybe you try to run the ball. There's going to be others that say no, no, throw the ball. I, I mean, what what do you think? I mean, obviously you got to do both, but you know, right? And and for starters, let's not forget that Villanueva blocking Miles Garrett one on one is a bad idea. Yes, not only is. not only of what happened last year, but think back to two years ago when we had a 21 to seven lead in Cleveland in the rain mm-hmm. and Garrett blew around Villanueva, didn't even touch him and basically stripped James Conner from behind. They created a fumble that then yep. Cleveland scored and we wound up tying them. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, you got to give Villanueva some help with Garrett. He can't match up with them. He just can't. Um, but I think I, you can, you can run the ball on this team. I, statistically, they have the fourth best run defense in the league. Right, um, they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but okay. part of the reason of that is they're middle of the pack in terms of of uh, yards per carry. It, well, part of here's the other factor though, Ben. Right, is they have the thirtieth ranked passing defense. I know. So, which is what my thought was when you started. To, I, you know, yeah. when Mark so, asked the question, it's like it's yes. throw the ball, you, you, you get a lead, and then when you've got a lead, you you switch back to a balanced attack so that you keep them off balance and you you know you you run some misdirection. Sorry, I'm taking your wind here. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say you throw the ball against whoever Denzel Ward is not covering, kind of like last week where we said yep. don't throw against Darius Slay, which which, which the Steelers did, did anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I loved. Yeah, and like, yeah, uh, yeah. This is a mismatch. I'm throwing that ball. Yeah. Okay then. <laughs> so yeah, th- throw throw against whoever Ward's not covering. I, I would I would say, and, and I just want to qualify the remark you just made. Statistically, they're the fourth best rush defense, but it's because they're so bad at defending the pass that people don't run on them. They yeah, just that's they throw the ball. At, yeah. Yeah. Well, and they've had, you know, obviously they they got whooped up on the opening week against Baltimore. 
Um, but they had uh, pretty early leads, obviously, against Dallas. They did last week against Indy, and I, I can't remember who they played in week two. Uh, Cincinnati, maybe. Um, you know, so so other teams, therefore, were going to throw the ball a lot anyway. So I, I'm not overly convinced that they're a good run-stopping team by any Indian, stretch. So. Indianapolis is an enigma, man, aren't they? Well, uh, well yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with Rivers, don't you I think? I guess. Probably. You're probably Ugh. right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Right. Right. <laughs> back um, to the Browns. Yeah. So, you know, it, it all comes back to, look, they're, they're four and one. They're in a position they're not, you know, they, when I say they're, their fans and their team, not really used to being in, um, in, in recent history. Uh, so, so this becomes a, a big game for them. And, and I, I still contend this is week six. This is not week 16. Um, there are so many things that are going to unfold between now and the end of the season um, that, that you know, and, and I'm not making excuses and, and I'm not suggesting anything other than, than what I know, which is I'll be rooting extremely hard for the Steelers. But um, I, I just, I, I the, the hype is just overblown. Um, let's just see how this game plays out before we get, you know, uh, any, any further with it. Um, what was I going to ask? I totally the, forgot. The next three games are huge. I mean, we've got Cleveland, yeah. Tennessee, and Baltimore all in a row. So, I mean, that's a it's a really good measuring stick for where this team is. You know, it, 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 it is. A it is. Bad. I mean, it's 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 going to be a consecutive, like four consecutive, really physical games. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to go play Dallas, and they're more of a finesse team. But it's it's four consecutive, really physical games. And if they can get out of that stretch, relatively injury free. I'm going to feel pretty fortunate, really fortunate. Yeah, about this no, I would too. Yeah, nope, yeah I, I honest, would too. Honestly, if we go two and two in our next four, I'll be pretty happy. Uh, I don't know about that, but three and one, I will be. It It is interesting how we change our perceptions. You know, I, I think a lot of us probably were guessing three and one, four and oh, coming out of the, those first four games. Now, again, that that's when Tennessee would have been the uh, uh, week what week four opponent. So um, yeah, you know it's it's interesting. I, I did want to get your thoughts, guys, on um, the performance of the rookie Claypool. And uh, Ian, I'll start with you. My my first thought was not even as much to do with him as it is with Big Ben. Yep, he trusts that kid, man. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean. I'm sorry, I, I and I'm I I'm interrupting here, but uh, look, usually Claypool, not always. There yeah. were some times that he threw at Claypool when Slay was covering him, but usually Claypool was covered by the number three corner, and the matchup was too yes. good to pass up. And Claypool six four and change, and it's like, yeah, I got a an obvious mismatch here, and he's fast and he's strong. Yep. I'm just yep. going to throw the ball to him, and it's not so much a matter of trust as much as. Look, you should make this play. That's it. I, I I agree with that, but I I still think Ben is the type that he's he's not going to throw it if he doesn't trust the guy to do the right thing. I agree. I, you know what but I mean. By the same token, I mean you look at Ebron who kept fucking up the last oh, game and then kept going back to him. Yeah. Well, so touche on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, what would you think of his performance, Ian? I mean, I mean, I I, I never saw that coming. No, no. I, we talked to, although I will say, we talked on the podcast last week about how tight ends could be the mismatch, which was basically whoever their linebackers were covering. And the Steelers yeah. did a good job of getting Claypool in those mismatch situations. So it was, they didn't specifically use the tight ends like I had mm-hmm. talked about, but it was mm-hmm. a similar idea of take advantage of their slot corners and their inside coverage because their inside coverage blows, um, which was really what they did with, with Claypool. Although they they used him on the outside too, and he should have had another touchdown that got oh, flagged God, for that, was that atrocious interference call. Uh, yeah, that, 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 was, that was really bad. But he he said that the rep acknowledged to him that he made a bad call. But really, yeah, he huh. said he said I, he made a bad call, and I was mad at first. And you know, refs are human. And he knows he made a bad call, and it is what it is. And and yep. you know, obviously, we won the game at the end of the day. So I, I mean, I have to presume that as calm as he was in describing all of that, that the ref said something to him and said, "Hey, you know, 
Mm -hmm. Sorry, I blew that one, but it's too late. You don't get to change calls on replay. No, no, that's not how it works. And and I'll be honest, when the play happened in front of us, I thought he did push off. But but then when you saw from the other angle, nope. it's like, oh, no, he did no, not. No, he did not. Uh, so I, I guess I, I, I could see that. But, yeah, Ian, you're, you're correct. You know, you talked about you thought how the, the tight ends would be a big factor. And um, it turns out it, it was a big guy that was a big factor. It just wasn't a tight end. It was Claypool. Yep. And that said, too, teams are going to now have to start respecting him and not just respecting him on those – crossing routes but respecting his deep speed as well Mm -hmm. which is going to open things up for everyone else in the passing game i don't know if we'll see another four touchdown performance like we saw this week but he's certainly going to have a role in this offense moving forward and make it all that much harder to defend the passing game as a whole and like we talked about earlier now that ben doesn't have to force the ball to someone who needs his ego stroked ben can work (laughs) those matchups to whoever has the mismatch on the field whether it's claypool whether it's ebron whether it's juju or deontay or james washington or whoever Uh, it's it's a lot more freeing for a quarterback to just be able to throw to whoever he wants to and not have to be like okay well i gotta make sure antonio brown gets four catches and 45 yards or whatever that stupid streak was he had for so five long. and 50 five and 50 that's right yeah whatever right. it was yeah yeah um ben i wanted to save this topic for you because i know it's been uh uh something that's uh been a burr in your saddle but um it sounds very much like the titans are not going to be penalized at all uh for this covid it, it doesn't sound like it that's that's what's happening well, okay. How in the wide, wide world of sports do they not get slapped with something? This team violated the rules yeah. by being told to quarantine and they held practices at other facilities. Well, okay. First off, they did not get a formal warning, if you will, about mm-hmm. not getting together until they'd already practiced the first time. Uh, Apparently they got it on the second day, but they'd already gotten together. Mm -hmm. So there were a couple of practices second day. They got, you know, basically a formal notification from the NFL. They were not supposed to be getting together, but as Vance McDonald put it, we all knew what we were supposed to do from day zero. If there was a problem, we were supposed to stay apart and they disregarded that. So, uh, you know, uh, nobody's happy about this no. except the Titans. No one. And the people that I've talked to have basically told me that Goodell decided that intent was too difficult to prove mm-hmm. here and that he didn't want to set a precedent that he was going to have to enforce later with other teams when there were other outbreaks. And... You know, and and then going back in and and doing investigations on every single team in the league and laying out discipline for people, you know, taking off a mask while they were at work one day. So, yeah, fine. I get that. But by the same token, he what he did was set a precedent here by not disciplining them. So the next team, next time this happens, he's got to let somebody off with it, somebody else off of the pass. And it's just what the hell is the point of laying out this protocol and saying, look, if one of you messes up, it's Mm going to affect the entire team and beyond. It's going to affect other teams too. You can't do it. You got to be careful. You got to take precautionary measures. You know, we don't want to make this a situation where we have 32 individual bubbles. We've considered that we're trying not to do it. You guys are putting us, you're putting our backs against the wall. Instead of saying that and doing something to these guys, he decided to do nothing, which I do not get at no, all. No, no. But, you know, it, not my decision to make. I don't agree with it, but it is what it is. I, I, I'm in the same position. I, I don't think you can let this go 100% without some form of a uh, a sanction, something, because uh, it, it, it just – it just shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have gotten as, as far out of control as it did. Um, but it is what it is. The Titans looked like a very rested team when they played on Tuesday night, uh, up on the bills. (laughs) 
Uh, of course, the Bills helped them with three or four turnovers, but uh, be that as it may. And uh, Ian, um, former Steeler Le'Veon Bell is no longer a New York Jet, and he's definitely not going to be a Pittsburgh Steeler. Sounds like he's landed in Kansas City. What do you expect to see out of him? Um, does he all of a sudden revert back to his uh, Steelers form, or is he more like his Jets form? I'd say probably somewhere in between is about where he lands. Kansas City has a pretty good scheme that will fit him very well in an Andy Reid offense. Um, it gives the Chiefs some security for Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, um, mm-hmm. who they really don't have much of a backup for after Damian Williams opted out of the season. So it gives them some security uh, with their rookie running back. And as we talked about early this year, running back is just not a durable position at all. So having nope. multiple guys to be able to start games here and there and share the workload is something you need. It makes the Chiefs all that much more dangerous in the AFC, certainly. Um, and they'll use him both in the running and the passing game as they should. Uh, part of his problem in New York was he's definitely lost a step, but the Jets line sucks. They're awful and their coaching was terrible. And there, it's just a, a concaphony of errors um, in New York, and they just don't know how to. They didn't know how to use them. They put them behind a terrible offensive line, and it just wasn't a good situation for him. Which was hilarious after the way he basically forced his way out of Pittsburgh mm-hmm. and chose to not play and for forego fourteen and a half million dollars and now is basically in the same spot financially he would have been uh if he had just signed the contract with the Steelers to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Ben, what do what do you think of uh, yeah, what, no. do you, what do you think you got? No, if he'd signed a Steelers contract by now he would have made about forty million dollars. Uh he's made he's gonna make twenty seven and a half. So I wouldn't say he's in the same spot financially. He cost himself money. Uh, by sitting out that year, he cost himself money. Uh, Bell, I don't know. He's probably. Oh, yeah. I was. I was thinking if he had played the year for fourteen and a half oh, on the yeah. on the right, franchise right. tag, and then signed the deal we offered him, which was was it oh, five okay. years, seventy the, the million. The second time they played. offered him the the deal, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But by the same token, there were rolling contracts in that uh, rolling guarantees in that contract. Excuse me, that would have assured him a spot at a very high salary on the team next year too. So, you know, that, that was a good deal for him. He was an idiot for passing it up. Oh yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, he was. But Uh, yeah, I think we dodged a bullet there. I really do. Uh, You know, I, I, going back to something we've talked about on this podcast before, you know, I, the conversation I was having with Matt Williamson one day on Twitter, and he's just like, look, you just don't give, you don't pay a running back who's in decline. And yep. Bell is already in decline, and it's just you just don't do it. You don't pay him based upon potential when his potential is lesser than where he's at right now. Yeah, and I, I did not completely wrap my head around that when he wrote it, but now I get it. I completely get it, and I I tend to agree with what Ian just said. It is a combination of the Jets' line being terrible their quarterback not playing very well either mm-hmm. and their coach sucking. He Adam Gase is awful. His offense is awful. How the hell does that guy still have a job? It's it's truly incredible, isn't it? I, it's because I, yeah. he coached Peyton Manning. He got that Peyton Manning bump and it got him a couple yeah. couple years. I <laughs> guess, man. I, you know. Well, gentlemen, uh it's prediction time. Um, the uh, Steelers and uh, Browns will kick it off at 1 p.m. on CBS. Brand. Tony Romo and Jim Nance are in town to call the game, so you know it's a big one uh, when when they come in. Uh, Ian, guess. what what do you what do you got for this one? What do you got for Brown Steelers on Sunday? Give me Steelers 27-24 with a Chris oh, Boswell field goal to win it. Oh, just what the hearts of Steelers Nation needs. <laughs> ben, go ahead. I got the same score, Steelers 27, Browns 24. But I, I think <laughs> I think the Steelers will be ahead most of the game and uh-huh. the Browns will try to come back and fail. Um, that's just my guts. 
you know, and who the hell knows? I mean, I yeah, I didn't yeah, well, think that game last week is going to go the way it did. Jeez, oh, you know, yeah, it was it was a very high scoring affair. I thought our defense would come through last week, and that the offense so. wouldn't have to bail us out, and it was the opposite. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I think you're going to see a special teams score by the Pittsburgh Steelers on Sunday. Hmm. Um, I just got a gut feeling something's gonna gonna click. Uh, whether it's a punt return, a kickoff return, I don't know. I just got a feeling, and I think you'll see the Steelers win uh, twenty eight twenty three. Um, I, and I, I again, I think the Steelers will survive a little bit of an early onslaught by this very fired up Browns team, and uh, uh, I think they just put the ball in Ben's hands like we've seen and and let him take care of it, let him run the show, and and what, uh, go one other there. prediction, one yeah. other prediction, yeah. you know, re- regarding the game on Sunday, yes. Steelers fans will bitch about the outcome. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. they will. It, yes. I mean, for sure. Yes, like, a lot loudly this team sucks we should be stomping them blah 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 oh my god oh it's the well, NFL, and, guys. And not only not only the outcome but also the trajectory i mean there have been people calling for tomlin's head at halftime of all these games that we won <laughs> we're, not, we're not playing well enough in the first half like games are 60 minutes for a reason and yeah we well. gotta play all 60 of them yeah that, although that's, i mean the Steelers yeah. defense in particular has aside from last week really excelled at making halftime adjustments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, last week they got some turnovers in the second half, so they made some adjustments. They just didn't get off the field on third down. I I mean – we we've we're four and zero, and yet we're complaining a lot. You know, well, yeah. well, the schedule well, was too easy. Blah blah. We blah. like I to mean, bitch. Can you imagine if we were two and two right now? I mean, the the yeah. sun and moon would have crashed by now on Earth. I well, or on Pittsburgh. It's a very honestly, I don't know if the complaints would be any different if we were two and two than they are for we're four. You, and you might be right. You might be right. Eh, no, I, some more people would be bitching. <laughs> I mean, the complaints would be the same in terms of tone, but yeah. there would be there'd be more people complaining about it. You know, I mean, we we all know people that we think have fairly decent football minds mm-hmm. that get a little too emotional about this crap on Sunday and Monday. Oh yeah, and, and tweet some dumb shit. We do. Oh, d- and of course. I I expect lots of that this week. <laughs> Well, and, and should there be a, a, a Steelers loss, I expect it to be uh, uh, ridiculously ugly as well. Um, because, of course, at week six, it'll be the end of the world, you know. Uh, but I digress. Yeah. Anyway. Well, like, I, gonna... like I tweeted at the very beginning of the week, that this was this was a big week for the sanity or whatever was left of it of Steelers fans. True. Spot on. Couldn't agree more. No, nope, it is. Um, we're going to get on out of here uh, for Ben and Ian. This is Steel Dad. You've been listening to the Steel City Blitz Steelers podcast presented by Deck Roofing Incorporated of South Florida. And hey, go Steelers. Ravens suck. No Fuck one cares the about the Browns. No <laughs> one cares about the Browns.